This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so today I'll be reporting on the most recent findings in the search for the evolution of the origin of the genes for T toxin production in Coke Goblis heterostrophus race T. As Gillian mentioned, T toxin is a secondary metabolite and virulence determinant that was the cause of the southern corn leaf blight epidemic in 1970. I'll be presenting phylogenetic and statistical analysis that show that the genes involved in T-toxin production share a common evolutionary origin with orthologous gene clusters in several other species of fungi, and that they may be foreign to the Cochalobus heterostrophus genome. I'll also be presenting functional analyses of two genes that are found in these other orthologous clusters that are not found in Cochalobus heterostrophus. As Gillian mentioned, this work informs our understanding of how hypervirulent strains of fungi evolve which could help us to prevent epidemics like the southern corn leaf blight from occurring again in the future. In order to understand the evolution of hypervirulence in Coglobus heterostrophus race T, we first must understand the conditions that led to this epidemic, as well as the mechanism underlying the interaction between the fungus and the plant. Back in 1970, the agricultural industry was ravaged by the southern corn leaf blight epidemic. The first evidence of this occurred in, 19, in March in Florida, and due to the warm and wet conditions that year, it spread rapidly up the East Coast and into Canada, covering 30 states and costing the corn industry an estimated $1 billion. It was so severe that it actually made the cover of the New York Times, no doubt, a rare achievement for a plant pathogen. Now, the underlying conditions of the weather were not the only cause, only contributor to this epidemic. It was also caused by the emergence of a new race of a relatively innocuous plant pathogen, Pocalobus heterostrophus race T, that had a hypervirulent and specific effect on a variety of corn plants that were widely grown at that time. Those corn plants carried the Texas male sterocytoplasm, or TCMS. Now, male sterility confers or facilitates outcrossing for hybrid vigor, and which eliminates the costs associated with the tasseling. At the time of the epidemic, more than 80% of corn in the United States that was used for hybrid production used the T cytoplasm, the T, T cytoplasm. Unbeknownst to growers at that time was the fact that this T cytoplasm also confers susceptibility to this newly emerging race of Cocalobus heterostrophus. Here is a field of corn carrying T cytoplasm inoculated with race O, the relatively innocuous pathogen that was previously known and was not considered a, a threat to agriculture, and then race T. And you can see the devastating effects that inoculation with race T has. So researchers quickly determined that, the, that race T differed from race O by the production of a small metabolite that came to be known as T-toxin. T-toxin is a linear polyketide, a family of linear polyketides of varying chain lengths with C41, the 41 carbon length backbone, being the most potent. Here you can see infiltration of uh, TCMS corn with culture filtrates from race T on the left and race O on the right. You can see the massive chlorosis that this has, the effect this has on the plant. T-toxin production segregates one-to-one -one and crosses with race O, the non-toxin producing strain, which suggested that this genes underlying production came from or were driven by a single locus. T-toxin accomplishes this hypervirulence due to the specific interaction with a protein that is unique to T-cytoplasm corn. This protein, URF13, is found in the inner mitochondrial membrane of TCMS corn. This protein confers the cytoplasmic male sterility phenotype, but also confers susceptibility to T-toxin. When T-toxin is present, the protein actually forms pores in the mitochondrial membrane, releasing the contents, resulting in cell death. Again, another picture of race O versus race T inoculated onto TCMS corn. The unique susceptibility of TCMS corn to T-toxin and the specificity of this interaction define T-toxin as a host selective toxin. Now, this finding that race T produces T-toxin, but race O does not, spawned this question of how does this newly evolved race, how did this race, this newly evolved race arise? Now, those questions being, what are the genes underlying T-toxin production, and where did they come from? So after decades of research, Gillen and her associates identified nine genes involved in T-toxin production, collectively known as TOX1. These comprise a complex genetic locus, as the genes are not tightly clustered. The genes are composed of two polyketide synthases, 
a five oxidoreductases, one decarboxylase, and a gene of unknown function. Now, T toxin is a linear polyketide, so at least one polyke polyketide synthase gene was expected. These other genes are likely involved in a, a um, modification of the resulting molecule. The genes are associated with a reciprocal translocation in race T relative to race O. You can see that depicted here in the lower right. Uh, there, in contrary to the one-to-one -one segregation findings, the genes are actually on two separate loci, referred to as TOX1A and TOX1B. <clears throat> they <clears throat> are inherited together uh, due to the complex genetics underlying this reciprocal translocation. <clears throat> the genes are surrounded by highly repeated AT-rich DNA, and they're not found in race O or any other close relative. Here is a graphical representation of the genes that I'll be using for the rest of the talk. The colored arrows indicate the different genes and their orientation relative to one another on this background of blue, which is the contig from the recently assembled genome. Notice that the contigs are not connected, and this is reflective of the fragmented nature of the locus and our inability to sequence the intervening regions in between them. So while it appeared that the genes for T-toxin production have been identified, the question still remained, where did these genes come from? Were they vertically inherited in Cochlobus heterostrophus, race T, or were they horizontally transmitted sometime before the epidemic? A seminal discovery was uh, found by one of uh, Gillian's colleagues, Candace Elliott, in which she identified orthologs of the genes in a, a different plant pathogen, Leptospheria maculans. Strikingly, the genes are found in a compact linear array, which is not how they're found in Cochlobus heterostrophus race T. <clears throat> this prompted a review of available genome databases, including Microcosm and GenBank, to search for other putative orthologous genes in other species. This resulted in the identification of several species of fungi, but not many that carry the orthologous clusters, uh, or carry genes orthologous to the TOX1 cluster. Strikingly, again, all these genes are found in a compact linear array. You'll notice that most of these are Dothidiomyces. However, there are a few Eurotiomyces, which is interesting because the Eurotiomyces and the Dothidiomyces diverged some 350 million years ago. <clears throat> also, what you'll notice is that, uh, that these additional clusters carry two additional genes, an ABC binding cassette transporter, and an oxidoreductase not found in the race T genome. The linear organization and the additional two genes found in many of these other species led us to hypothesize that this organization and composition was the ancestral states of the genes found in Cochlobus heterostrophus race T. So my research in Gillian's lab has been uh, underlined two overarching questions. First, what can we learn about the evolution of TOX1 from these scattered genomic data? And two, was the loss of the ABC and OXR genes somehow critical in the evolution of T toxin production? So I'll break the rest of the talk. We've broken up in two sections. Where I'll address each of these questions. So what can we learn about the red TOX1 evolutionary history? For example, do these clusters found in other species share a common evolutionary origin with the genes for T toxin production? And two, can we determine the mode of inheritance of TOX1 in Cochlobus heterostrophus race T? <clears throat> I thought about answering these questions by using the TOX1 proteins in Cochlobus heterostrophus to blast the microcosm and GenBank databases, pulling down the top 100 hits from each of these databases and conducting a phylogenetic analysis. I also evaluated protein features, including amino acid identity and GC content. With the results of these analysis, I was able to infer whether they had a common evolutionary origin and whether there was any evidence for vertical or horizontal transmission. <clears throat> While the identity, amino acid identity and the GC content data were significant and informative, due to the sake of time, I'm gonna focus primarily on the phylogenetic analysis I conducted and I'll give you the points, the main findings from the amino acid and GC content analysis. So firstly, individual gene trees constructed using the TOX1 genes as query, show that the TOX1 proteins cluster with high support, which supports a common evolutionary origin of the genes. Here I'm just illustrating the PKS1, PKS2 gene tree with the TOX1 proteins blown up, so you can see them. 
in red are the dothidiomycetes that carry these clusters, and in green are the erosiomycetes. What's interesting about the topology or the branching order in these trees is that the erosiomycetes are nested within the dothidiomycetes. This is incongruent with what we would expect given the taxonomic relationship between of these classes. <clears throat> this also suggests that there could be a horizontal acquisition by the erosiomycetes from the dothidiomycetes at some point. And by con congruent, what I'm referring to is phylogenetic congruence, which is an approach to evaluate the mode of inheritance of genes by comparing a gene tree to a species tree, which serves as a reference. A species tree like this example can be constructed using highly conserved single copy genes of your taxa of interest. The topology here is reflective of the evolutionary relationships of your taxa and your data set. So keep an eye on taxa D. Now, if we construct a gene tree, and this gene tree is congruent with the species tree, taxa D is in the same place, then we can infer that the gene that we're evaluating has been inherited vertically, much like the genes that are compo composing our species tree. Now, if the gene tree is not congruent with the species tree, as in this example below, then we can infer that there may, must be, or may have been, a horizontal transmission to that taxa. In other words, the gene tree does not conform to, is not congruent with the species tree. So what I was interested in this analysis is the TOX1 cluster as a whole in Coccoglobulus heterostrophus, not individual genes. So what I did was instead of conducting individual gene trees, I concatenated all the genes in the TOX1 locus and, and conducted a phylogenetic analysis to, a, to determine if the, the genes were congruent to a species tree, like so. So here's a, conserved, a species tree composed of conserved genes and all of my TOX1 proteins concatenated in a multi-locus sequence typing approach. Again, what I'm interested in is the topology or the branching order of the TOX1 tree. Now this analysis comparison that uh, in this case is complicated due to the fact that I don't have an out group to include in the data set. So the topology of the TOX1 tree is not directly comparable to the species tree. But what I can do to evaluate congruence is to conduct a topological constraints analysis, basically constraining the TOX1 tree to the species tree topology and seeing if that is significantly different. So here's my species tree. I'm showing this unrooted format uh, right now so that this, because this emphasizes the divergence between the sequences. Here I I'm point, want to point out the Eurotiomyces in green and the Dothidiomyces in red and this long branch that separates the Dothidiomyces from the Eurotiomyces. This is, in, this is indicative of the divergence between these classes and wh what we would expect. Now, if we look at our TOX1 tree, I want to also focus on that same branch between the Erosiomyces and the Dothidiomyces. Note that these trees are shown at the same scale. So the divergence between the Erosiomyces and the Dothidiomyces is not what we would expect given their taxonomic relationships. This is, indicates that the genes are much more similar to the Dothidiomyces than they are, than we would expect them to be. Also supporting hypothesis of a horizontal transmission. Another couple of points that I want to make is that in the species tree, Coccoglobulus heterostrophus is clustered with Leprosaria maculans, which, support, which is supported by other larger scale phylogenetic analysis. But in our TOX1 tree, Coccoglobulus heterostrophus is, is clustering with Didymelase matus. Didymelase matus is the only other species of fung fungi that produces a toxin with specificity for the URF13 protein. However, we don't think that that is why they're clustering together in this tree. What we think is happening is a phenomenon called long branch attraction, in which the two, these two clusters are not together because of their similarity to one another, but because they're equally dissimilar to the rest of the taxa in the data set. So if we root these trees, into a more conventional format, what we see is the species tree conforms to larger, broader scale phylogenetic analyses. Rosiomycetes are sister to and not nested within the Dothidiomycetes. Coccoglobus heterostrophus is the youngest data, one of the youngest taxa in the data set. The TOX1 tree here is midpoint rooted because, again, we don't have a natural outgroup in the data set. What we can see is the Rosiomycetes are clustered or nested within Dothidiomycetes and not separate from them. And again, heterostrophus is clustering with Didymelase matus. So here is where I 
perform the, the uh, evaluate the, the topological congruence of these two trees by conducting a topological or a uh, phylogenetic constraints analysis. So what, what that does is when in, this, in the Bayesian analysis, which is the analysis that I'm using, the, the tree that's produced has what's called an estimated model likelihood for that tree. And now you can run separate analysis running different models, uh, and then you can compare the estimated model likelihood for each of those trees, and the model, the tree with the best likelihood is your best hypothesis. So what I did was I allowed this analysis to run unconstrained, and I, re and I received an estimated model likelihood. I then constrained the, the data to fit to the species tree topology, and then compared the model likelihood of that tree to the unconstrained tree. And what I found was that the TOX1 cluster data do not conform to the species tree. In other words, they don't follow a pattern of strict vertical inheritance. <clears throat> Estimated model likelihood difference was over 1,700. And by this metric, greater than 150 is considered strong evidence. So even though we can't make a direct comparison between these trees without, a, without being rooted, what we can see are some similarities or dissimilarities between the trees that give us some information about mode of inheritance. For example, in the species tree, um, C. aquaticus and Lingomyces uh, and Goldianus cluster together, which is what we would expect. In the tox1 tree, they do the same. This suggests that the tox1 genes have been inherited vertically through evolutionary time in those lineages. Also, what we can see is Ascochyta rabii and uh, was messed up A. quisqualis. Uh, do cluster together in the tox1 tree, but they are not each other's closest relative in the species tree. This suggests a possible horizontal transmission between these taxa as well. Again, heterostropus and Didymelis amatus are, are distinct from the rest of the tox1 tree, suggesting the possibility of a horizontal transmission. But what we can say for sure is that they're not similar to the rest of the tox, the tax in the data set. So. I have to breeze through the um, GC and amino acid analyses, uh, but what I'll point out is that in the GC analysis, the TOX1 proteins in Cocalobus heterostrophus and Didymelis amatus are significantly different from the GC of the rest of the proteome, suggesting a, a foreign acquisition or at least atypical to the proteome. Amino acid analysis concurs with our inferences made from the topological analyses in that uh, there is evidence for vertical and horizontal transmission. What I'd like to point out, especially from the amino acid analysis, is the identity between the genes in Cochalobus heterostrophus and these other taxa. Note that they're all relatively low in the 50 percentages. Okay, what this tells us is that if the genes were horizontally transmitted into Cochalobus heterostrophus, it was likely not from any of the taxa in our data set. We don't have a strong link to a donor based on this analysis. So what have we learned about the uh, TOX1 evolutionary history? Do the TOX1 clusters share a common evolutionary origin? From this phylogenetic analysis, we had identified, or we identified 11 species that harbor the cluster, and there is support for a common evolutionary origin due to the clustering in the individual gene trees. Here I'm using PKS2 as an example. Can we determine the mode of inheritance of TOX1 uh, in Cochalobus heterostrophus? From the phylogenetic analysis, what we can say is that TOX1 in Cochalobus heterostrophus race T is much different from other TOX1 clusters found in other species. We can also say that TOX1 does not conform to a pattern of vertical inheritance. And from the evaluation of the protein features, we can say that TOX1 is atypical relative to the rest of the proteome in Cochalobus heterostrophus and low identity uh, low amino acid identity between the Cochalobus heterostrophus genes and the other taxa precludes any of these taxa from being a possible donor to Cochalobus heterostrophus. So to summarize the first section of the talk, the TOX1 cluster appears atypical within the genome based on GC analysis. This supports the hypothesis of horizontal acquisition, but without a strong link to a donor species, we cannot exclude the possibility of vertical inheritance and divergence of the cluster. The next part of my talk is functional analyses. What I was interested in was this, the role of these ABC gene and this oxidoreductase gene that are found in these other species but not found in Cochalobus heterostrophus. 
the loss of these genes, I hypothesized, could have played a critical role in the evolution of T-toxin production. So in order to test that, I deleted the genes in one of these other species and evaluated whether or not the species produced T-toxin after the genes were deleted. I also then attempted to integrate these genes into Cochlealbus heterostrophus to see if, once they're in the genome, if they disrupt or abolish T-toxin production. So chosen for functional analysis was Corynespera cassiopeia, which our collaborators have shown to be genetically tractable and for which the TOX1 cluster has been shown to play a role in virulence by deletion of the PKS gene. The approach I used for genetic manipulation was pioneered by Gillian and her colleagues and involves uh, the simple generation of PCR fragments which contain a, a marker, selectable marker of interest, flanked by regions homologous to flanking regions of a target gene to be deleted. So recombination of the PCR fragment with the wild type chromosome results in replacement of the gene of interest with the selectable marker. I use this approach to delete both the ABC and the OXR genes in Corynespera cassiopeia separately, and then I assayed for T-toxin production. I assayed for T-toxin production, again, using a, an approach that was developed by Gillian and her colleagues, in which E. coli transformed to express the URF13 protein, the target protein of T-toxin, are used because they, this, uh, this transformation confers sensitivity to T-toxin. When plugs of hyphae are placed onto a lawn of this E. coli, a halo will be produced around them if T-toxin is present. So I plated my mutants, my ABC mutants, and my oxidoreductase mutants onto lawns of E. coli expressed in the URF13 protein. You can see my controls are along the bottom. Race T, which produces a halo. Race O, which does not produce the toxin, does not produce a halo. And the Corynespera cassiopeia wild type. You can see there's no strong halo in any of my isolates which tells me that deletion of the ABC and OXR genes does not result in T-toxin production in Corynespera cassiopeia. So then I asked, what about, this in what about integration? And what about moving these genes into the TOX1 cluster? Will that somehow disrupt or affect production of T-toxin? I used a uh, targeted gene insertion approach, also developed by Gillian, similar to the deletion approach, except in this case, a gene of PCR fragments carrying a gene of interest, flanking, with flanking regions homologous to a site of interest are generated. Recombination of this PCR fragments with the wild type chromosome results in insertion of the gene of interest at the target site. This transformation is conducted uh, with a linearized plasmid conferring antibiotic resistance. So here's a, basically my approach here, my PCR fragments carrying individual Corynespera cassiopeia genes, um, targeting them to the region neighboring uh, TOX9 and the, and the TOX1 cluster. And I'm using hygromycin B, initially hygromycin B in co-transformation. So I did, this, I did this experiment with the ABC gene individually, the OXR gene individually, and the ABC and the OXR gene together. And several attempts, I found in screening multiple candidates, I found one mutant that harbored both the ABC and the oxidoreductase gene ectopically in the genome, so not at the target site of interest. Now, this is strange because this transformation approach has so has been proven to be extremely efficient in Cochlealbus heterostropus and other filamentous fung fungi. So, what I what I considered was that it might be possible that the target site that I was using was somehow recalcitrant to integration. Something maybe that maybe because of the AT rich region along this flank that I was having difficulty getting the gene where I wanted it to be. So, what I did was I conducted a separate experiment in which I used those same flanking regions to integrate my selectable marker directly. So, I took high hygromycin uh, gene for hygromycin resistance and I put it right into the same spot that I was trying to put the other genes to see if it would work. It worked. Uh, it worked on the first try. It worked just as efficiently as any other transformation protocol that we used in the lab. And my, my very first candidate, HIG11, uh, had the gene correctly integrated. So I confirmed this by PCR evaluation uh, and also by crossing this mutant to a race strain that does not produce T-toxin. 
the rationale behind this is that if the gene for hygromycin resistance is correctly integrated at tox one, then T, T toxin production and hygromycin resistance will co segregate in the progeny of this cross. And that is what happened. So here on the left are, is a hygromycin B plate. And here on the right, any plate with the E. coli assay, with E. coli expressing the UR13 protein. Same plugs on both plates. So what we see, race T, race O, my controls, and my HIG integration mutant on the bottom on the HIG plate. No growth of race T and race O, which is what we would expect. Growth of my hygromycin integration mutant. And these are individual ascospore progeny from the cross of HIG11 to C5. You can see that these three are growing on the hygromycin plates. And if you look over on the E. coli assay plate, those same three are producing T toxin. This was true for 110 single ascospores that I evaluated. So perfect co-segregation between of T toxin production and hygromycin resistance, indicating that the gene was correctly integrated at tox one. So having this mutant with hygromycin resistance at tox one gave us a platform from another, for another attempt with strong selection um, to integrate the Corinesper cassiaicola genes. In this case, what we're trying to do is use this, use the hygromycin B site is, is to replace hygromycin with our gene of interest, co-transforming with a separate selectable marker. So the candidates from this transformation will be resistant to geneticin and then sensitive to hygromycin, meaning that the gene at the locus was replaced by my gene of interest. So I conducted this experiment um, a few different times, screened a couple of hundred candidates, and found one mutant that had the gene for the ABC uh, transporter integrated again ectopically somewhere else in the genome. So <clears throat> all of my candidates were then geneticin resistant as well as hygromycin resistant, indicating that the hygromycin gene was not being replaced. So one more attempt at this integration is uh, underway in which I'm going to be using a, uh, a complementation approach that was developed by Gillian. And in this case, my gene to replace hygromycin will be linked to my, the gene that I'm trying to integrate. The purpose behind this will be, or the rationale behind this is that the resistance marker is linked, directly linked to the gene of interest. So any candidates that I have out of this experiment that have geneticin resistance should also have my target gene right beside it. So what I'm hoping to happen is that I'll identify that this will be uh, reduce the number of false positive candidates and then I'll be able to recover um, isolate or uh, mutants that have the gene correctly integrated. So even if this is not successful, I still have generated a couple of mutants, uh, one that has the ABC and the OXR integrated ectopically somewhere in the genome, and another that has the ABC integrated separately, also ectopically. So I can use these in evaluation of, uh, test my hypothesis. Firstly, I check to see if these mutants were expressing the ABC and the OXO reductase gene by RT-PCR and cDNA. And you can see here, uh, the ABC fragment is present for both the ABC mutants and the double mutants, indicating the ABC is expressed in those mutants. And the OXR1 fragment is present in the, in the double mutant, indicating that's expressed there. So I then conducted the E. coli assay to see if these mutants had any disruption or abolishment of T-tox production, and it turns out that they did not. So integration, ectopic integration and expression uh, does not disrupt uh, T-toxin production in these mutants. So to summarize the functional analysis part of my uh, talk, was the loss of the ABC and the OXR1 genes a critical turning point in the evolution of T-toxin? Well, deletion of the OXR and ABC and OXR genes does not result in production of T-toxin in Corinesper cassiaicola. And insertion of the genes ectopically uh, into Cotylobus heterostrophus does not uh, abolish T toxin production, while well, well, I'm still working on it, trying to get these genes uh, directly targeted at, to the toxin locus. So, to, su to summarize the work I've done under these two overarching questions, uh, what can we learn about toxin evolutionary history from these data? 
and was the loss of the ABC and Oxard genes at critical turning points. Um, my conclusions are that uh, TOX1 is much different in Cogalobus heterostropus than the other TOX1 clusters that we've identified. Uh, TOX1 does not follow or conform to a strict pattern of vertical inheritance. The GC analysis supports a hypothesis of foreign origin in Cogalobus heterostropus. However, the amino acid identity analysis precludes the possibility of any of the taxa in our data set being a potential donor. In short, the TOX1 cluster follows a pattern of evolutionary, of pattern of evolution similar to other secondary metabolite genes being discontinu discontinuously distributed across several species, fast evolving and with evidence for vertical and horizontal transmission among lineages. Next, was the uh, loss of the ABC and OXR genes a critical turning point in the evolution of T toxin productions? We can say that the deletion of them in Corinesperas cascycla doesn't result in T toxin production, and integration at ectopic sites and expression does not uh, disrupt or abolish T toxin production in Cocalabus heterostrophus. Therefore, the presence or absence of these genes in the TOX1 cluster is not alone sufficient to result in the production of or the disruption of T-toxin. Therefore, other factors must have been involved in the evolution of T-toxin biosynthesis. So at this time, I'd like to acknowledge a few people who've been important to me in this uh, past five years, um, primarily Gillian and the Turgeon Lab, Heejin Park, who taught me literally everything I know at the bench. Uh, anyway, and Bradford Condon, who laid most of the groundwork for the analyses that I did, and Vahida, uh, Rico, Adriana, who have been friends and colleagues throughout this past five years, my special committee, Maria Harrison and Magdalene, uh, collaborators, um, Akagi and Kodama over in Japan, as well as the admin, admin and facilities folks here who keep, the, keep everything moving for us in the department, and I think that they're really unsung heroes, especially, especially Brian Flanagan. If you've ever had a chance to interact with him, he is like, uh, he's like 911 for, for us here. Um, fellow grad students and faculty, I, I couldn't list everybody, but I wanted to list a few people who were, who whether you knew it or not, played a, a really important role in my, uh, my success here at at, the, at this university. And, and uh, you've been friends to me and have been supportive of me. And I just wanted to give you a special shout out. Um, and especially here, Teresa Pulaska, uh, the phylogenetic analysis I conducted, I, she got me started in, the, in that field. I had no experience in that at all. Stuart Gray, who effectively was one of the people that got me in here in the first place. Zhao Hong Huang. Uh, was on my uh, was a, was my field representative in my A exam, who for some reason let me let me get let me through that, <laughs> and other people. If and and if you're not on this list, I it's I I just want you to know you know you know that uh, you were there and and I, and I appreciate uh, your support. Lastly, I'm dedicating this whole experience, this past ten years of college, actually, to two people, my mother. And my, and my dog who just passed away, who I love very much. My mother doesn't look like that anymore, although she kind of still does <laughs> in a real way. <clears throat> and Vinny was my hero and my best friend for a long time. All right. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. So John, I kind of wonder, in 1970, you, your map that you showed early on, was that the distribution of race T? That was the distribution, that was the, the path of the epidemic, of the race of the uh, Southern Corn Leaf Light epidemic. And, and could you assume that race O was also present through that area? I, yes, I would definitely assume that. Um, race O was known since, I think, the 1920s. Uh, to be a, a pretty innocuous pathogen of corn. It was not considered a threat to agriculture, but it was, it was known to exist in the field. So my question then is, if race T was distributed that widely, it only ruined 10% of the crop. Why? Was there some sort of, of, kind of protection? 
protection from race O from race T in many of the plants, or did it? Was it just really poor and infecting large numbers of plants? You're for, you mean you mean race T? Race T. Okay, Stewart's question is, if race T caught, I mean, if I got, if I understand correctly, if race T was able to cause this massive epidemic, why is it only ten percent of plants were affected? Well, ten percent of the crop. Ten percent of the crop. Ten percent of the plants. Right. Why was it only 10%? Um, well, I would have to look at the data regarding the, uh, the widespread use of T cytoplasm corn. So this interaction is, is so specific. So race T only accomplishes this hypervirulence on T corn carrying the T cytoplasm. So that 10%, I, I don't know what the percentage of other varieties of corn were being produced at that time, but I do know that 80% of corn used for hybrid production carry the T cytoplasm. So what percentage of the corn used, what, what percentage of that was of uh, the corn used altogether? I, I'm not sure, but that is, that's a good question. John, the other thing to think about on your map is the temporal aspects of that map. You're showing end of the season there. Correct. Got, but you might right. think about the temporal implications of that. So um, in terms of the, the rate at which it's so, spread over the course of the season? Well, What's the impact if something arrives at a certain growth stage versus another? Right, throughout the season. Okay, okay Penelope had a question, and uh, I'd like to answer that real quick. Yes? Yeah, so I was just wondering if you could uh, try to create a double mutant of the um, Oxari genus, the ABC genus, and create a double mutant of the Oxari genus, the ABC genus. In Cocoabacitis Cytostrophus? Yeah, that was, that was the plan. Um, what, so what, what the initial plan was was to get one of the genes in there, and then get the other gene in there with it. But we had a really difficult time getting, uh, accomplishing part A. So, uh, so part B was, uh, was never actually accomplished. What we, what we would hope to do is in the second approach, using the resistance marker linked to the, co the Cornespera casalicola gene would be to get that in there and then replace the resistant marker with a different resistant marker and the other gene. So then generating the double mutant. So that, that would be the plan if um, I, don't think I'll make it before I graduate, but um, I'm definitely, that's definitely the plan. Yes, Tier. In non QC events, does the presence or absence of T-toxin have any discernible effect on the amount of damage or the fitness or, yeah. I mean, does it make that's any a good question. Right. So what I can tell you is that uh, race T um, has lower fitness on N cytoplasm corn, which is non T cytoplasm corn. So race T is somehow, uh, is somehow uh, it's, it's, it's a fitness cost to produce this toxin to the fungus. Um, whereas race O, uh, it, relative to race O. Morgan. The knock-ins, um, I'm wondering how much of a promoter you included uh, mm -hmm. if you're intending to knock into what's well, presumably a co-regulated region. Like, did you not have a lot of promoter? Mm -hmm. What if it went in ectopically and then also did you look at how much expression you're even getting from that ectopic integration? Because right. it may be that your phenotype is just because you don't actually have that gene right. doing anything. Yep. Yeah, that's, the, that's excellent questions. And, and those, those, all of that has been on the table. What Morgan's asking is, what about the promoter that you're using when you're bringing corn esper cycle over? What, how much of that promoter is this? Is, is this promoter even going to uh, induce expression? What about the level of expression of the gene in the mutants? And this, these are all issues of concern that we are dealing with. I've actually just got this RT-PCR data a couple of weeks ago. What I would like to do, of course, is quantitative PCR to see differential, see if the, if the extent of the expression of the genes. Uh, for, in, in regards to the promoter question, what we did was in designing this uh, integration, we went upstream from the start site, uh, I think uh, five or 600 base pairs, to attempt to in, ensure that we had the promoter. And so that extension upstream actually in, bordered went right to the boundary of the the neighboring gene so we think we got the promoter in there uh, another thing that we considered doing was to swap out that promoter with an, a different promoter something that we know would work well in cocalabacitis heterostrophus uh, but since we know since we see that we're at least getting expression we don't think that that's that's necessary at this time yes adam the two genes, you know, you had a heck of a time getting any integrations, the single integration you got was ectopic. Correct. And you've shown with the QPCR that, okay, those transcripts are being made. 
Uh, here's the standing part. Could you do a no RT control for that experiment to make sure you're not picking up just DNA that's there? And the second one is even if there's transcripts, um, it might not be functional transcripts. So there, right. may, there may have been strong selection for spontaneous mutations in the coding sequences. Right. That's something else you can want to look at. Yep. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So in, in terms of part, uh, Adam's question or Adam's comments were that well, just because we're getting transcript doesn't mean that we are um, not detecting uh, background DNA, correct? And also uh, just because we're getting transcript doesn't mean we're getting a translation. So we don't know if the protein is actually getting made in the fungus. That actually, we're, there's also things that have been concerning to us and, and how to address those uh, things is, is uh, is something that we're considering. Um, <clears throat> in, in terms of whether or not we're getting background DNA, what I can tell you is that my actin bands are correct for uh, their length based on the events on post uh, processing. So there, there's an intron that's in those, in between those bands, and because of the length of those bands, we don't, we can, we can assume that we're getting actual mRNA. We don't have any additional bands suggesting that there is actual DNA being detected. Um, yes, Alan. What's known about the uh, first appearance of geographical origins of race T? That's a really that's a really interesting question. Um, race T, there's I think uh, in the uh, late 50s or 60s uh, was the first identification of race T, and I think that was in the Philippines, if I'm not mistaken. Um, after that, I think there was some a state in the Midwest that reported hypervirulence on corn. Uh, but I but I could have that history incorrect. So prior to the use of T cytoplasm corn, it would have been difficult to detect race T in the field because there would have been no specific host to result in this hypervirulence trait. It would have been difficult to distinguish race T from race O. So race so from the 50s, starting in the 50s is when T cytoplasm corn was used, and that was also when race T was first detected. So it, prior to that, we we really can't say. John, I was just focusing a little bit on your uh, your species tree. And yep. you we're looking at, uh, it was Leptosteria, I think was the closest relative there. Correct. So interpreting that in light of your your uh, uh, hypothesis here, does that suggest then that uh, each of both the Cochlabulus hemorrhistropus and that Leptosteria acquired um, through horizontal transmission in two separate events? Since sometimes since they diverged from a common ancestor, is that is that kind of the inference there that there would have been two different times that they acquired uh, and acquired separately? The, the that <clears throat> that <clears throat> is that is definitely possible. With but we cannot uh, we cannot make draw any conclusions based on the clustering in in our tree or based on the amino acid identity uh, between the different gene clusters. So, um, and that, but it's definitely possible that when we, and we do assume based on uh, the evidence that we have that there may have been multiple transfers of the gene cluster. But we, what I can say is that lingomyces in Goldianus is one of the most early diverging dothidiomyces and it carries the genes. And based on its clustering with its nearest uh, neighbor, Aquaticus, in the species tree and in the tox one tree, it looks like Lingomyces and Goldanus has been carrying the tox one cluster for a long time, and that is and that is one of the uh, earlier diverging species in the lineage. So there, we believe there was some loss of the cluster and some transfer of the cluster, and this follows a, a pattern of evolution that secondary metabolites generally show. Yep. Teresa, um, thinking about your species. Trees versus or tree versus um, your gene tree. Yes. Not topology, but branch lengths. Correct. So, just by eyeballing the uh, gene tree, the branch lengths are much longer to the node compared to species tree. Would you like to comment on this? Sure. So, Teresa's. Uh, uh, comment was that in our species tree, we see very short branch lengths, uh, especially within the Dothidiomyces. And then there's this one long branch that separates the Dothidiomyces from the Erosiomyces. In our Tox1 tree, we see massive divergence of all the sequences. They're spread out on these long branches everywhere. 
So these long branches indicate that these, these toxin clusters are highly diverse from one another, which is what we would expect given the nature of secondary metabolites. Now, that's not true in the species tree because in the species tree, we're using highly conserved single copy genes. Purpose of this is because we know that they are conserved and we don't expect the branch lengths in that tree to be very long. We expect them to be short. Those sequences are actually very similar to one another and that's why they're used in the analysis. Um, what would be interesting would be to compare the TOX1 tree topology and those branch lengths to other genes, other background genes, in the, and see if there is a difference in divergence. Also, what I can tell you in support of this uh, answer is that Tier Weisner Hanks conducted a, a DNDS analysis of the TOX1 genes and found that the TOX1 genes don't show any differential rate of evolution compared to the background uh, genome. And there's no, like, positive selection of them. I'm sorry? And there is no positive selection? No evidence right now. Correct. Yeah. All right. If there are no further questions, Thanks thank you for coming, much. everybody, today. I really appreciate it. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.